August. So. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, they kind of gave away my punchline there. But <laughs> all right, cool. Good. Uh, is there a uh, there's an RRP? echo okay. here? We have an echo somewhere. Not sure. Maybe now it's now it's gone. Okay. Test test. Welcome. Okay. Yeah. okay. Welcome, <laughs> David Mazier. Who's gonna talk about stake reputation, not cryptocurrency? All right. Well, uh, uh, thank you. Well, is this? It feels like it's feeding back. Can we turn the gain down on this? Or anyone having like? Uh, on the Maybe I'll just move the move it further away from my mouth. This is fine. But, all right, great. So, uh, why blockchain? Uh, you know, we're all here because pr probably what we're excited about blockchain. Many of us have a bl blockchain projects, um, but you know, in the the like nine years I've, I've been at this. Um, there's, I, I've had a, just a number of people come to me with like really bad misconceptions about like what blockchains are good for and what they're going to do with blockchains, depending on kind of what, what part of the hype cycle we're on. I really think we're feeding back. Um, yeah, we, how do we, Okay, how's this? How's this? This is better. Yeah, we just needed lower. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, and on the other side, you know, like I've met regulators and like economists and stuff who are like hugely skeptical of like how bad blockchain is for things, and they also have like a lot of uh, a lot of misconceptions. So I think it's good to kind of drill down and say like, what is it fundamentally that is uh, so cool about blockchain? And uh, you know, the short answer is it's not cryptocurrency right getting excited about cryptocurrency in 2023 is like getting excited about cell phone minutes like 15 years after the iphone and app store have come out right there's just so much more possibility with the technology and like maybe someone needs to worry about metering but uh it's just not that interesting anymore all right so i think there's two really big deals uh, about blockchain um and it's worth keeping these in mind as you make all design decisions for the the kinds of systems that you want to build on blockchains the first is that it's financial infrastructure with uh, open self-serve access and when you're already in uh an industry uh, it's it's very easy to underestimate the value of something being completely self-serve, right? Imagine, you know, in the 1990s, trying to explain eBay to someone who works at like, you know, Christie's or Sotheby's or something, right? And they, they might say like, oh, we have a great auction system. We run like dozens of auctions a day and it's like super easy, right? And they just don't get the value of just like anybody be able to, being able to list anything on eBay, right? Um, or, you know, go to a bookstore owner in, in the 90s and try to explain to them how like, People can publish stuff, you know, on websites and they can just kind of self-publish and they'd be, be like, well, my bookstore has a great relationship with dozens of independent book publishers and whatever, right? And they don't get the idea that like maybe you want to publish something in smaller units than books or, or magazines or that you want to be able to update it after you publish it, right? That there's a, a lack of imagination about what you can do when you already have access to the industry and the ability to do things. But I think that uh, what history shows is that the difference is even more salient when uh, when it comes to software development, right? So if uh, you know a lot of young people in this room, but you know if you're around in the in the uh, in the '90s, um, there was this kind of big moment when. Uh, uh, Netscape added uh, LiveScript, right? And suddenly you didn't have to wait for Netscape to add features. Website developers could actually program the browser, right? And this was like a huge thing. And now, of course, it's second nature. Like who can imagine a web browser without JavaScript, right? Um, again, you know, look at the innovation we've had since the App Store and Play Store compared to like waiting for Nokia to add something to their feature phone. Um, and also just kind of what you can do with really easy APIs like PayPal and Stripe compared to, you know, becoming like a, a Visa merchant acquirer. So what happens when you have blockchain plus smart contracts? Well, suddenly you can program your money, right? Um, and so that uh, has led in, in the same way that, you know, when you increase the number of developers who can develop on something, you vastly increase the pace of innovation. And so being able to program your money has basically been every bit as uh, exciting and scary as you can imagine, because there's a huge amount of innovation and there's a huge amount of innovation in, in, in fraud as well, of course, which is something we have to deal with. All right. So uh, the second big deal, uh, and I'm grateful to Isaac for kind of setting this up for me, um, 
is that blockchains let you execute secure atomic transactions in new contexts where it was just not possible before, right? So, uh, so you know, and this is obviously because it's replicated everywhere and everyone can verify that the history hasn't been tampered with. So we're all familiar with the double spend problem. Uh, it seemed impossible in 2007, but suddenly, you know, with Bitcoin, it became possible to not only to use digital signatures to authenticate that like you're transferring ownership of something, but to put the history of that transfer in a blockchain uh, so that everyone can agree that you've transferred ownership and you can no longer double spend a coin that you've already given to someone, right? Um, and that was kind of a, a huge deal. But honestly, I think we're still just scratching the surface because we're still focused too focused on the cryptocurrency uh aspect of this and you know i like the the example isaac set up where what if you want to buy you know like a plane ticket and uh, a hotel room right and you want those to be uh, atomic right and so i think where uh this is going is that we should exist in a world where essentially any two databases in the world can, you know, that expose API to third-party developers should be able to commit a transaction atomically, right? And once you enable these third-party developers to start gluing these different systems together, you will get uh, all kinds of innovation that you didn't have before, right? So let's say there's one freight company that's willing to ship your cargo from New York to Chicago and another one that'll ship it from Chicago to Stockton. Now some third party can, you know, bundle these things together and tell you, you know, sell you a product that's cheaper that will get your cargo cargo all the way from uh, New York to Stockton, and they won't have to take any risk about like legging into the position, right? Because they can commit this atomically across uh, multiple blockchains. Now, I think I, where Isaac's vision and mine differ slightly is like, yes, it'd be cool to do this atomically across blockchains, but I think it'd be cool to do it across just legacy databases, right? Um, just have any two legacy databases that expose some kind of API to, uh, to have these atomic transactions. And uh, you can do this because the, the big problem with distributed transactions is like, well, what if there's a failure, right? And you don't know what happened, right? But you can assume that the, the blockchain will not fail or will eventually be live. And so the blockchain is kind of the ideal two-phase commit coordinator that everybody can agree. So everybody has to like basically sign their, uh, their pre-commits and it has to be committed in the blockchain by some expiration date. And if it isn't, then, you know, it's aborted. And if it, if it does commit, then, you know, the transaction committed. All right, so um, we all know that we need consensus to make our blockchain secure, right? The security comes from the fact that the transaction history, like the ledger has been basically replicated on a whole bunch of machines. Uh, that replication helps with robustness and decentralization and interoperability, but uh, it only works if everybody agrees on, on what's happened. And what most blockchains use is some variant of incentive-based consensus, like proof of work and proof of stake, where basically what you're doing is you're granting cryptocurrency to people as a reward for them doing things that make the uh, the blockchain history more secure right and these incentive based consentive mechanisms are fantastic if you want to distribute some new cryptocurrency right like amazing you can give out bitcoin to people in a way where there's a limited supply and yet people believe it has value and the value is like skyrocketed right like, who could have imagined this in 2007 probably even satoshi nakamoto didn't think it would it would get to the to the point that it did right uh but what if you don't care about cryptocurrency right if you view cryptocurrency as kind of cell phone minutes and that's not the interesting thing you actually care about kind of issued assets then what does this mean for you and uh the thing is that, uh, so so what do I mean by issued assets? Well, I mean, basically an issued asset is any digital asset that's a liability of some like real world uh, issuer who can, you know, be sued and, you know, uh, brought into the criminal justice system if they try to, you know, uh, either commit fraud or, or, or default on their liabilities. Examples of this would be central bank digital currencies, deposit back stable coins, tokenized securities, carbon credits, loyalty points, like whatever, anything where the value comes from a promise by someone in the real world. And so the problem with trying to secure transactions and, and these kinds of issued assets uh, using incentive-based consensus is that the incentive-based consensus fundamentally requires people to believe in the future value of the cryptocurrency, right? It doesn't make sense if like you think the cryptocurrency is going to go to zero. At the very least, you, you need to think that the, the value is going to be stable. Uh, but the problem is that the only intrinsic value of cryptocurrency is paying for transactions, right? It is these cell phone minutes. Um, 
And so the main source of value is that people actually think that the value of the cryptocurrency is going to go up. So they want to like speculate on it. Right. But this isn't uh, necessarily a, a sustainable model. Maybe it is if all you care about is cryptocurrency, but if you care about, you know, carbon credits or something like this, this is, is a little bit weird. Right. Uh, and in particular, there's several ways in which issue, issued assets uh, have very different trade off trade-offs from cryptocurrency. One is that the main utility um, is cross asset interoperability, right? Uh, you don't need a blockchain to do PayPal, right? You need a blockchain to, you know, create some new asset and have a, immediately bootstrap a liquid market so that people can use their PayPal dollars to, you know, buy your asset and, and other assets and, and so on, right? Uh, so the second difference is, again, if you're betting on cryptocurrency, you kind of, you're making money off uh, fees, off demand for, uh, for crypto, for blockchain transactions, right? And if you care about issued assets, then what you really want is for this stuff to get too cheap to meter, right? You want layer one blockchain transactions to be too cheap to meter, like the kind of stuff that Jeff Ramsayer is doing at Stanford, right? But again, if you believe in that vision, then cryptocurrency as a way of keeping people honest in a consensus protocol uh, is maybe not so good. Um, and then the final point is that you cannot, in real world assets, you can't subject the issuers to the whims of anonymous miners and stakers, right? You can't, you know, deposit your money at Wells Fargo uh, and then Wells have Wells Fargo say, oh, uh, sorry, we lost your money and we're good. But like, you know, two thirds plus one of our competitors were acting strangely. So your deposit got reversed order. Like that's not an acceptable outcome, right? Like if you're, if you take someone's money, you are on the hook for whatever digital asset you issued them. All right. So the, so you basically end up in the situation where it's very tricky to tune the uh, the incentives properly in these uh, consensus mechanisms, right? And if you get it wrong, then you can end up with a very costly double redemption attack, right? You could issue like millions of dollars of uh, of digital dollars, and then you could face you know redemptions for like twice that much because like the the blockchain forked, right? So you have the situation where if your token transactions are too valuable uh, for the incentives, uh, then your security is not going to be good enough. And if your token transactions are not valuable enough, then you're going to have kind of excessive fees, right? Because you kind of need to pay these fees to, to keep people uh, interested in keeping the blockchain secure. Um, and in a way, one way to view this uh, is that part of the problem is that you're basically giving up on a lot of uh, investments that we've made in society in things to kind of try to make the economy work well. So these are things like, you know, reputation, like ownership rights, like the ability to enforce, you know, pen and paper contracts in, in court, bank regula regulation stability, right? All that goes out the window when your financial infrastructure is run by a bunch of anonymous people and you don't know who they are. And the only thing keeping it secure are these incentives. So to make this a bit more concrete, let's look at some numbers. There's this uh, great website, crypto51.app, that shows you how much it costs to attack a proof of work blockchain. And you can see it would cost like, you know, like 1.3 or $5 million an hour to attack Bitcoin, right? So that sounds like a lot, but maybe if you're gonna issue like billions of dollars of stable coin on this thing and like have, you know, uh, billions of dollars of volume a day, uh, this actually isn't enough to, to keep things uh, secure, right? And then as soon as you drop off from Bitcoin, everything else is just like tiny, right? Like tens of thousands of dollars uh, of incentives keeping these blockchains secure. So this should be very scary if you're thinking about issuing a real world asset uh, onto one of these proof of work blockchains. Okay, but maybe proof of work is passe. We're all about proof of stake in, in 2023. So let's look at uh, some, you know, a, a, a selection of, uh, of popular proof of stake blockchains. And here I had to pull data from multiple sources. And unfortunately, real TPS.net is, is down to the first column, the average TPS, those numbers might be slightly out of date, but this is for kind of order of magnitude to see. And what you can see from this, the first thing that should jump out of this chart is that, you know, an Ethereum, they're collecting like almost a billion dollars of uh, of transaction fees a year uh, for not that many transactions per second, right? So you're talking about, uh, you know, on average, people are going to pay several dollars per transaction. You know, it goes up and down, sometimes it's much more. And so... That means that kind of like layer one transactions on Ethereum are just way too expensive for many, many applications um, that, that you could think of. 
Um, so if you look at the other uh, extreme, Algorand uh, is a blockchain, really high quality blockchain, like very nice proof of work, uh, sorry, proof of stake algorithm, right? Uh, and it also has like, you know, sort of high quality tooling, people like to develop for it. Um, and low fees right now. But uh, unfortunately, Algorand has about $211 million staked on it. Um, and you can start seriously messing with a proof of stake blockchain when you have like more than a, a third of the stake. So, so like around, if you had a hundred million dollars of algo, you could start seriously messing with transactions on there. And of course you could potentially uh, lever up and get a hundred million dollars of algo by like, you know, putting maybe 10% down and like borrow, borrowing the rest. So for basically $10 million, you can start to mess with people. Um, and so that should make you really scared about issuing, say, like a billion dollar stable coin on top of Algorand, right? And there's other things that make this worse, like liquid staking would might give you a way to like get, uh, you know, the, get other people to kind of lend their stake to you. Um, and things like shorting and derivatives would allow you to maybe like profit if you tank the value of, of Algorand because you're attacking the system and so on. So all that should be kind of uh, kind of scary. Um, so uh, so there's something else that's kind of troubling here which is look at the difference between the fees that are be co being collected uh, on a yearly basis and the incentives that are being paid out to validators, right? Um, so that's anywhere from like 2X for Ethereum to, you know, uh, 100X uh, or more for some of these chains. Um, that gap basically represents the fact that cryptocurrency speculators are subsidizing the network, right? Uh, many times over compared to the fees that are being collected. So again, that's not gonna be sustainable in, in the long run, right? So of course, if you look at Stellar, my blockchain, things look different, right? Because you're not staking anything other than your reputation. Um, we don't pay out any incentives to the validators. Uh, and you know, not coincidentally, it has the lowest fees of pretty much any public blockchain out there, often by many orders of magnitude. So what is it that Stellar does? Uh, how does Stellar achieve security uh, without having to pay out these incentives, which ultimately become a drag on, on transactions and real world assets? Well, what we use is uh, something that we call proof of agreement, right? Because now everything has to be proof of something these days. Um, we used to call it a federated Byzantine agreement, but that was kind of a, a mouthful. So uh, the basic idea is to uh, make agreement actually the basis of your consensus protocol, in particular, the desire for organizations to want to agree with one another pairwise, right? So the basic abstraction that we introduce is this notion of a quorum slice, right? Every validator in the system picks a set of other validators called a quorum slice that uh, that are knows that it wants to make sure it agrees with. Um, and then a quorum has to satisfy everybody's quorum slices. So in this example, nodes V2, V3, and V4 are a quorum slice uh, and a quorum because it's kind of a quorum slice for each member. If you look at V1, V2, V3, that's a quorum slice for V1, but it's not a quorum. V1 saying, I'll agree to anything V2 and V3 do, but V2 and V3 are saying, we won't agree to anything unless V4 does. So the smallest quorum that includes V1 in this case would be the set of all nodes. And you know, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but we had an SOSP paper on this in 2019. So that's probably the best, uh, best reference for how this works. So, all these uh, consensus protocols have some kind of assumption, right? In proof of work, you know, you're assuming the good guys have, you know, somewhere between 51 and 67 percent of the the hashing power. For proof of stake, you're assuming, you know, generally, you know, at least two thirds plus one of the stake is is going to act uh, uh, honestly. What is it that we're assuming uh, in this new proof of agreement model? Um, and in particular, obviously, if you have two uh, organizations and one of them says, hey, I always want to be, uh, I never want to disagree with you, then they will never disagree. But suppose you have, you know, two organizations in different parts of the world that don't have a direct relationship, maybe a bank in California and uh, one in Mumbai, will they agree with one another? And the answer is it depends, uh, but they but they will if when you look at kind of the, the transitive closure of these quorum slice relationships, there's some common transitive dependency. And if that's the case, then everybody's kind of going to end up agreeing on the same thing. And like almost every validator in the world will will agree that, you know, the same blocks are being appended to the blockchain. So the hypothesis here is something I call the Internet hypothesis, which basically says, 
take any validators you'd actually care about, and they will share some common transitive uh, dependence. And kind of empirically, this is true of the internet, right? The internet peering architecture was a big inspiration for this model. Like, you know, China maybe can't talk to Google, but of course, China can talk to Stanford and Stanford could talk to Google. So transitively, we have like one internet. And if I showed you any other disjoint IPv4 network, you'd say, well, that's not the internet, even though there's no definition of the internet saying it's the, the one that contains Princeton or Amazon or, or Google, right? Um, and so if two people don't disagree in this model, like maybe you don't care, right? Maybe North Korea goes and forks off their own version of the blockchain history and you don't care. Nobody cares because they're isolated. And no one does business with them. All right. So how do we build uh, a consensus protocol uh, that actually works uh, in, in this model? And this is what, you know, my consensus protocol, SCP, uh, does this, which has been uh, securing the Stellar blockchain since, since 2015. Um, basically <clears throat> what you do is you, uh, broadcast every time you send a message in the consensus protocol, you actually broadcast, uh, you, you'll include in the message what your quorum slice is, right? Or at least a, a, a hash of it. And then people can fetch the pre-image if they haven't cached it. Um, and so all the validators are digitally signing all their messages in the protocol and specifying their quorum slice at the same time. Now. As I described it, it's a little too brittle, right? Because some, you know, servers go down for maintenance. So you're actually allowed to choose multiple quorum slices and you're satisfied if kind of any of your quorum slices uh, ag agrees with you. So your quorum slices might be, you know, a, a majority of the nodes at every one of like three organizations you want to agree with. And that way, like those organizations can individually bring down servers uh, for maintenance without affecting the liveness of the system. So, uh, so basically you proceed in this model when you have a, a quorum and you learn what a quorum is dynamically when you see what other people's quorum slices are in the messages that they broadcast. Um, and there's some other nice benefits here. Like there's very low computational cost. You, all you need to do is, you know, sign a few messages and, and, you know, do some set comparison things. Uh, there's a little energy consumption, there's a little latency, um, and there's no fancy crypto here. All we need are basically digital signatures and, and hash functions to make this work. Okay. So, uh, you don't actually need, uh, a validator, uh, or you need to run a validator if you're going to build products or issue tokens on the stellar network. Um, but you should at least specify which validators uh, you yourself are, are going to use when, say, redeeming tokens that you've issued. Um, and uh, the reason to do that is that then that protects you against double spend attacks, right? If you tell everyone, hey, this token's worth a dollar because, like, you can send it back to me and I'll give you a dollar. You say, oh, and by the way, this is the validator that I'm using to make that decision of when you've redeemed it. So if you care about getting paid in my token, just make sure you agree with that particular validator, right? Um, and, you know, of course, if you run a validator, then you also get a say in governance uh, in the network. Uh, and here's the thing. If you're actually building a product on uh, this Stellar blockchain, then you probably want a full node anyway, because you want to have a local copy of the ledger. And so turning on validation, it doesn't cost anything, right? Because there's no, like, proof of work or anything. You're just, you know, signing a few messages. So there's, there's really no incremental cost. Uh, and of course, another nice thing is you can do this at any time, right? You could do something on Stellar um, and then, you know, later on decide, well, this is actually very important to my business model. And then, you know, if you're doing this on a proof of stake blockchain, you say, uh oh, now we need to like accumulate a bunch of stake uh, in order to like have some say in the network or otherwise like, hey, all these other validators are like eating into my profits because like they're getting these staking rewards. Um, and, and that's not going to happen here, right? There's no staking rewards. And if your project's important and you stand up a validator, then everyone's going to want to agree with you because they're going to care about your product. So, you know, uh, so this is a nice model to basically uh, be trading on your reputation instead of your crypto holdings. So kind of to summarize, you know, incentive-based consensus is, uh, you know, is very good for, you know, cryptocurrency and maybe pure uh, DeFi type applications, right? Uh, so if you want to create a new cryptocurrency and distribute it such that there's a limited supply, but like people, you know, believe it has value because it's getting out in some fair way, then, you know, things like proof of work have been, you know, extremely successful in that way. And if you, what you want to do then is, you know, play poker with anonymous people on the network and win cryptocurrency, then, you know, this is like fantastic. This would be what I call it like a pure DeFi type applications. Um, 
And the thing about pure DeFi applications is that forks are okay, right? You know, if you have Bitcoin and it splits into Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision and whatever, that's okay because when you duplicate a, uh, you know, a pure cryptocurrency uh, by forking a blockchain, then if you had one of the asset before, you now have one of each of the branches afterwards. So kind of no, no one's in a position to complain. Same for ETH forking off into ETH Classic and ETH POW. Um, but it's a big problem when it comes to issued assets, right? Because if you issue a digital dollar, which is like a real world, is a real world liability, if you duplicate the blockchain, you can't duplicate the underlying dollars that are that are backing those digital assets, right? So what that means is that the incentives are kind of going to place a ceiling on like how valuable your product can be if your product is trading in, in real world liabilities on top of the blockchain. So. What's the solution? Well, what you should do obviously is stake reputation rather than cryptocurrency by using uh, the Stellar consensus protocol. Um, and then kind of your reputation is gonna naturally grow with the importance of your pro project, right? So it just, everything scales uh, exactly in sync. Um, you're also leveraging all these investments we've made in society and like the court systems and whatever. So like if you, you know, people are gonna trust your product because they know that they can sue you in court if you're, if you're not, uh, uh, if, if you're doing something sketchy, um, that if you if you use this model, you don't need to lock up capital. You don't need to like risk slashing uh, if you're participating in proof of stake. Uh, you don't need to share your product revenue with validators because you know again the goal is to make this stuff eventually kind of too cheap to meter um, the the transactions. Um, and of course, most importantly, there's no need to assume the risk of uh, faulty validators, right? Because you can always run your own validators or like hire someone to run validators for you and say, hey, I redeem when when the, whatever these validators uh, uh, say I should redeem. Uh, and then that kind of protects you uh, and protects people who are holding your tokens. Thanks. It works, it does. Other questions, comments, feedback? So to wake the audience, yes. <laughs> nice talk, thanks. Um, you motivated your talk with connecting random databases on the internet mm -hmm. um, to Stella in that case. And now I'm wondering um, how that would look like with the validators. Has a validator like a unique write access to some subset of the state? Um, yeah, so uh, all you really need, and Stellar even s supports this already, you don't even need smart contracts, you just need a way to, uh, to require uh, that other that multiple parties sign a transaction, right? And so then the the transaction could represent a pre-commit in two different databases. And each database doesn't even know what the other database is. They just know that like somebody else needs to sign uh, the transaction for it to be valid. And then the blockchain en enforces that, right? So we might like put like a memo in a transaction say that says, okay, this memo is, is gonna have a collision resistant hash of like a hash that is a transaction on my database and a hash that's a transition on your database. And now we're gonna say that this transaction has to be signed signed by both of our public keys or both of our signature keys. And it also has to be submitted into the blockchain within like 20 seconds from now, right? So now if, uh, so, so now if, if I then see that that thing is the blockchain, uh, I don't know who you are, but I know that like I committed to this thing and whoever constructed the transaction is happy that you that you also pre-committed to it. So I just committed it in my database. On the other hand, if I see a block that has a later timestamp than the expiration date on the thing I pre I on the pre-commit that I signed, but it's not um that but the thing hasn't been committed, then I know that it's safe to abort. Okay, thanks. Basically, it's a pre <laughs> two-phase commit coordinator using the blockchain's time stamp as a as a two-phase commit coordinator. Uh, yes. <laughs> I give the microphone to Isaac here. So I guess along those lines, if I'm going to do that, um, presumably the thing I really care about in the next round of consensus is if I'm doing a two-phase commit with um, with Giuliano's database, is that my database agrees with Juliana's database. So I might change my quorum slices to be uh, basically just Juliana. Uh, well, actually you might not, you don't know, you might or might not know who Juliano is, right? So 
so basically whoever's constructing, there's there's some third party who's building an application that uses both of your databases, right? And so that person knows who both of you are. And what you both need to do is expose some kind of API that lets people construct you know, transactions that'll work across any databases. But you don't necessarily need to know um, you know, uh, you know of, of each other, right? And so, right, but, but um, changing my slices that way, if I if I do know who I'm working with, changing my slices that way ensures that we will actually be working on the same yes, fork. Absolutely, the but but that, in a way, that's not your problem, right? I want to make this self serve. I want to say like, hey, here's two things that people haven't thought about hooking up together. I want to build a product that does that, and I want to be able to do that in a unilateral way. So, what I that's why I need this internet hypothesis that like if I go to you that like and I look at you, of course, I'm going to know what your validators are and what their quorum slices are, so I can check ahead of time that there's some sensible configuration and the hope is that like oh yeah you guys you may not be in each other's quorum slices but you guys both depend on Citibank or you both depend you depend on Citibank you depend on Wells Fargo and they both depend on standard chartered or something right and so whatever it is like I think that there's kind of sufficient uh uh overlap that it's safe to construct a transaction across uh you two and so and the assumption is that like if if we deploy this thing and and we use this model that basically any two database you care about will it will be safe to do this and you you can check it ahead of time obviously but and then a related question you mentioned that uh it, if i if i issue a, a product um that a lot of people are interested in and then presumably a lot of people will add me to their quorum slices mm -hmm. um presumably this is because if i'm working with someone's uh product i would want them in my quorum slices so that i know that i agree with them yeah um what should I mean? I, I shouldn't put everyone whose products I'm interested in in all of my quorum slices because then I'm limited by the worst case of all of their liveness. So, what should my policy be as uh, a user there? So, I mean, what what I, what I think would uh, a likely or one possible scenario would be that you know it's sort of a bit like email like it's a large number of people use uh gmail or like g suite right for the for their email right so there are it's not like every company needs to like stand up their own mail server but it's important that you be able to stand up your own mail server because that's going to prevent google from engaging in like rent seeking activity and like locking you into something like the way facebook messenger or whatsapp does and so uh so you know i'm happy with in a world where like you know the number of of organizations running validators is sort of comparable to the number of like tier one ISPs in the world, you know, um, and, you know, everybody buys internet service from someone, but like, you know, really, if you want to, you could just like, you know, set up your own ISP or directly peer with someone or something. Thank you. Um, my last question was when you showed the reputations, like when you showed the investment needed to break the 51% attack, right? Yeah. So the maxes from the Bitcoins and all these other chains, they would say, of course, now we have an exact calculation of how much it costs to break our chains. And then it's surprisingly low for some of them, right? Mm -hmm. Now in, in the other world where we have the reputation, this cannot be quantified in that way. That's right. So do we have to quantify this? Do we want to do that? Or why are we not missing out on the quantification? Well, I mean, the thing is, like, we have, like, a very large, you know, investment in, like, a regulatory infrastructure to, like, do things like keep our banks honest and, and solvent and stuff, you know, and it's not perfect, but it's, like, it works pretty well. So, uh, so the deal, so the idea is, like, let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's, like, leverage what we're already doing right in the financial system and but you know fix the things that are wrong like how hard it is to innovate right by making all this stuff self-serve okay so you're saying that the chains don't exist in a vacuum they should also exactly <laughs> exactly or like and the core the organization like because the because the, because the miners and validators and stakers are anonymous it's kind of like you throw all the existing stuff mm -hmm. out, right? But when they're known organizations, then they're okay. You can like sue them or whatever. Like they can put out some legal document or they can buy insurance or like whatever. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>